Hey, this is Notzer. We are debuting a brand new series called Just For Fun. And as the title implies, it's just for fun. It's an excuse for me to be able to talk to you. And hopefully you guys and gals will enjoy. The game in the background is iRacing. We are in the Toyota GR86, the silver one in the center of the screen. This is at Watkins Glen, New York. This is a casual race. Everyone has the same car, so it's all driver skill, baby. And uh, speaking of driver skill, that uh, gray and yellow car goes up the middle. The white car blocks them off, and they go three wide into one on a road course. Uh, <laughs> probably not going to work. I hear squealing. Yep, white car takes out another white car and a third white car. A bunch of white cars messing up turn one or getting knocked out. It's unfortunate for that second one with the purple. He was just an innocent bystander, man. Just got taken out. He was actually, like, right next to me, so got pretty fortunate there but yeah I want to be able to talk about things that I like and I like motorsport racing I actually abandoned it for like 15 years and boy am I sad that I did that but YouTube is basically an archive for all the favorite racing series and I've been chugging through all of that iRacing is amazing sim racing is so much better so, to paint a picture, I was a young five-year-old in 1994, and my favorite driver was a Rainbow Warrior. Uh, can you guess the car? Yeah, DuPont, Jeff Gordon, NASCAR. He was amazing, but the car looked so cool, too. And I love that part about motorsports. The livery, the paint schemes, they're so fascinating, so it's always fun for me to see that. And at the time, a game came out called NASCAR Racing by Papyrus, and it was really blocky, really old, 1994 graphics, but it was really good. It stood above a lot of motorsport titles, even though it was predominantly an oval base. There are two road courses in uh, NASCAR racing one. But it's predominantly oval. Oval's fun for racing and side by side. And normally road course isn't this contested and close, but in this one it was, so I wanted to share it. I love all forms of racing. I love it. I can't get enough of it. It's really enjoyable for me. So I don't care what other people think. It's by far the most entertaining sport in my opinion, and it's the one that I feel most invested in. So, yeah, I'm just really happy that I've returned to motorsport racing and being a fan. So, yeah, iRacing, great. But, so, Papyrus created NASCAR Racing. They released, subsequently, NASCAR Racing 2, 3, 4, and NASCAR Racing 2003. And you can imagine that NASCAR Racing 2003 came out in 2002. No, of course <laughs> But when it came out, it was the last game that Papyrus did. And skip over five years to 2008, and then iRacing is released. The same individuals that were responsible for NASCAR racing, they built iRacing, and the idea was, you know, we did such a great job with NASCAR, why don't we do every other motorsport as well? And that's pretty much the basis for this game. And ever since, they've been refining it to the product that you see here. There's actually going to be a weather slash rain update in December or January. It's really close. The water in the rain will create dynamic road course races, which are just really fun. It's going to be really fascinating to see it in the game and obviously visually really impressive so it's nice that they're adding that extra layer of realism this company is really good at creating tire models and the surface is really refined and the cars and the, the momentum and the crash model it's all it's, it's just so satisfying i can honestly say that if i could play any racing game on the market right now iRacing is the one I would play. 
and I'm completely serious. It just feels so satisfying to play. But yeah, obviously you're seeing it. It's entertaining for me. Hopefully there's some motorsport fans out there who watch my content too. Now that's not the only thing that has invested. I have invested my time and attention into. Obviously World of Warships 12.10 came out. I think the patch was well received. I think the commander skill update is really nice. And I just wanted to continue forward. You know, further refinement, further adjustment. I would love it if every single skill had nearly the same percentage pick. Because then that means that every skill is viable to some extent. And if every skill is viable, then different play styles are viable. So that's really where I want Wargaming to continue to go. And I think 1210 is a great example of a good direction for Wargaming to go for commander skills. The improved repair party skill could have further refinement though. It was finalized so late in the process that I don't think they put any, any consideration for tier. So the 2 million potential damage requirement is the same for everyone, which is much easier at tier 10 than it is at tier 5, so I would like it to potentially consider that. Otherwise, it just ends up being a high tier only skill, because most players won't be able to farm that much potential damage. But, you know, other than that, I don't have really any complaints. I think that they're going in the right direction as far as the patch is concerned and the buffing and nerfing of ships and commander skills and equipment. However, the Kitakami is a source of drama that I haven't really acknowledged too much other than like a passing comment on stream. So I'm just going to talk about the Kitakami briefly. It is a torpedo cruiser. It will be Available in the dockyard for this holiday season, and it will require 80 of whatever the dockyard um, docks are, or phases, or waves, or whatever. Which is twice as much as you would normally have to fulfill. So just like the Puerto Rico, the primary value that Wargaming sees from this is an opportunity for players to invest money in their game. Regardless of anything else about this, that is the number one priority of the ship. It exists to make them money. So of course they're going to min-max it. Two years? I have to wait before you release it? Outside of this dockyard? Which people have suggested that it will cost anywhere from like $1,700 worth of currency. Insane. Very high priced. I don't like the tier weight. I wish they didn't do it. But I don't make the game. I just cover it. I will just say that the Kitakami is basically a submarine cruiser. It has the sequential torpedo reload mechanic of other submarines. And it also has the different torpedoes. You can choose standard or deep water. So having both of those options really creates a dynamic choice that the player has to consider. So I've, I've really enjoyed my time with it. It also has exhaust smoke too. Completely different from the Kinokami that they were gonna release eight years ago instead of Otago. And that's really, that's really frustrating for me. This is a golden opportunity for Wargaming to exploit the fact that the Kitakami name has been in the news for the game since the beginning. So they have that brand recognition to further create this fear of missing out. And I really hate that. I really hate that they exploit fear of missing out. But that is obviously their goal is to make money. You know, you can love a game as much as you want, but at the end of the day, you have a job and the game exists because it makes enough money so that it keeps the lights on. It's a game as a service, so of course a game as a service is going to overcharge for items that are in the game. It's just 
the nature of these. And the best thing that you can do, don't spend a dime and just play the game. That's the best thing you can do. If you are so, uh, um, you know, infuriated by the Kitakami situation, that's the best thing you can do. Give good feedback, but don't spend a dime. And, you know, even say in your feedback, you know, maybe I would feel more inclined to spend money if I felt like the game was better overall for a veteran, not necessarily for a whale. So, yeah, I think that it's okay to go after money because money makes the world go round. I just wish that in the pursuit of money, it wasn't so obnoxious. You have the early access. That's two patches that you have to wait. That's not a bad. Honestly, I think the early access is one of the best things that they did. You can generate revenue on something that will be free to the player to unlock. All they have to do is invest time. So you are literally asking them, do you want to spend money now or time later? I really wish that that was the question they were asking with the Kitakami, but that is not what they're asking. Now, obviously, games are cool, but there are other things to life than games. So I love history and reading. And uh, one of the things that have been in the news a lot lately is unidentified aerial phenomenon or unidentified flying objects. And these are obviously objects that exist in the atmosphere with no explanation, <laughs> obviously. There's been a lot of documentation, especially recently, that is just hard to refute. Now, stuff that we've heard, Tic Tac, uh, there was a U.S. military operation on the West Coast. They were testing something, and it drew attention of a giant-looking Tic Tac. <laughs> And this was well documented by radar data and all this sort of thing. It was all subsequently um, grabbed by some people in black suits. And we've never seen that data ever since. But the people operating these instruments definitely know what they saw. And the instruments definitely were working. So, yeah. At least 15 to 20 different instruments documented that this object 100% existed and 100% could be seen by everyone. And it was actually engaged in an aerial engagement by a fighter where he was attempting to try and investigate the object. So this occurred, well documented. Okay, well, is there more things that are out there? Yes, there are a lot. Uh, how about a nuclear arsenal deactivated remotely or the knowledge that Roswell is 100% real 1947 disc crash lands in Roswell two debris fields extraordinary material disc discovered by children playing occupants near the disc the US Air Force the army for one day it was real and then it was a weather balloon by the whole world's account. But that can't be the only thing. It is not. And the reason it's not is the nuclear. They know about nuclear atom splitting. Why do they know about nuclear atom splitting? Because when you split an atom, it gives off a gamma ray burst. And this is something that cannot be detected with the, the naked eye, but can be detected around the universe because it's that extreme. So if you have the right instruments, you can actually listen for gamma ray bursts. They are natural in the universe, but they're also unnatural. And it's pretty unnatural to all of a sudden be blowing up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gamma ray bursts because they're setting off atomic bombs. So yeah, the Roswell may have been investigating atomic bomb testing. And you might go, well, okay, well, that was that. Is there any other example that would be similar to the Roswell? Yes. It was actually a European Roswell that occurred in 1933. Now, just before this, we discovered splitting the atom. A uh, scientist, I don't know his name, in Europe, was able to split the atom for the very first time in human history. And obviously, that very first atom that split 
gave off a gamma ray burst. And subsequently, there must have been investigations from our friends above to send what is described as a disc-shaped object to investigate, and this was in Europe. And for some reason, it crashed in the Italian mountains and was subsequently discovered by Mussolini, shared with Hitler, locked away in Italy, and and probably... um, retroactively investigated two occupants were discovered both white male appearance but they were not white male humans but they could definitely fool most humans into believing that they were white males and that makes you think huh tall white males with exceptional features that were discovered in an exceptional object that was flying around that can't be explained. That kind of sounds like a good basis for the master race theory that you might hear from that neck of the woods at that period. So there could possibly be an interconnected story between all of this. Um, Remote viewing, uh, all of the different aspects of this, just so fascinating, but yeah. Check out 1933 Italy UFO and 1947 Roswell. Both of those are 100% factual that they occurred. They've just been covered up so well. But a lot of technology came from those events. And there are further examples of that, which I can go into in other videos. But yeah, really interesting. Hopefully you guys enjoy this conversation. Leave in the comments what you think. And uh, thanks again. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I'll catch you guys on the next one.